Well, there is a outdated notion that protein, for some reason, will quote unquote tax your kidneys in some way. That is just wrong. Hey, friends, this is Felix, your friendly neighborhood kidney hacker, again, coming back for episode number three. Today, we're going to talk about protein quality. We talked about the issues with protein already mainly the issues in understanding how a lack of protein can actually give you the wrong impression of improved kidney function. In episode number two, we talked more about how not to do it, and now we're gonna talk about how to do it. So, protein, very contested topic in the kidney area. Why? Well, there is a outdated notion that protein, for some reason, will quote-unquote tax your kidneys in some way. That is very outdated information. And there's even papers now that acknowledge that it's just wrong. Protein, as we learned in the last episode, is actually, if it's the right protein, able to give your body the raw materials to actually increase kidney function. It does this, as we discussed, by glomerular hypertrophy. So the growth of the glomeruli which are the heads of your functional units of the kidney, the nephrons. If your doctor actually told you to eat low protein and it's not something you came up with yourself, then it's probably time to find another doctor that's a little more up to date with the current research. If that's not you, then congratulations, your doctor is probably one of the good ones. So protein is not the problem, really. Protein is part of the solution. How much protein do you actually need? There's actually a pretty established range now that goes from 0.6 gram per pound of body weight to about one gram per kilogram of body weight. And no, this is not the weight of the meat. I've had people asking this. If I'm saying you need 0.6 grams of protein per pound of body weight, that means actual protein, so not meat weight. So for example, 100 grams of ground beef, which you would find in a standard like burger patty in a smaller one, would have about 25, 28 grams of protein, depending on how much fat is in there. So you would have to eat a little more than some people might assume. Now, the types of protein are super important. When you look at animal protein, there's really a couple of options, right? You could have beef, you could have lamb, you could have pork, you could have chicken, or you could have some of the vegetarian options like whey protein, some of the dairy options, cheese. Of all these options, you really want to stick mostly to beef and lamb because these animals have multiple stomachs. And these stomachs have the amazing capability of converting all the fatty acids from their diet into saturated fat. We can go into that in another video. Saturated fat is good for you and you do not need to worry about your cholesterol levels. I'll probably make an extra video on cholesterol for that. Instead, make sure that your triglycerides are lower than your HDL. When you eat chicken or pork, these animals mostly are fed with high omega-6 fatty acid containing foods like soy or grains. These fats basically make it into their fat directly. They're not converted in any way. Only sheep, lamb, uh, goats, cows, pigs and chickens can't do it. That is the problem. So that is one of the main reasons that we want to stick to beef and lamb. And if you're sticking to beef and lamb, then you still got to make sure that you're getting adequate quality. So that means they are getting a species appropriate diet. They need to be grass fed, really. You can find lots of grass fed options, but um, there is also a little bit of shenanigans going on because some people are declaring their food grass fed, even though it is not grass finished two different terms. You can feed your cow uh, with a lot of grass throughout life. And then in the last couple of days or weeks before slaughter, maybe 60 days, they will put them on grains to fatten up so the farmer can get more money to sell his cow. Of course, that basically destroys most of the um, benefits that you would have gotten with extra nutrients that are in the uh, in the grass. In that case, you're basically getting a grain fed cow if it's not grass finished. The best way to make sure is actually to know your farmer. But uh, of course, there's mail order options that have great reviews and whatever. I don't recommend any particular brand. It's probably always best to find your own and to uh, establish a relationship with them so you can really be sure that they're not uh, fooling you. So you want real grass-fed beef or real grass-fed lamb. 
And those kinds of proteins are going to go a long way to getting you the right amount of protein and great quality. This kind of protein, as we learned in the last video, is actually able to give you a little bit of a boost in kidney function even, because it triggers glomerular hypertrophy. You might uh, remember that word from the last one. Now that we cleared that up, there's a lot of people that try to stick to fish. The issue with fish, of course, is mercury. Most of the fish is super contaminated with, with that and, and with PCBs. There's all these toxic things, sadly, in our oceans. I would love to be able to just, you know, eat a fish out of the ocean unchanged. But sadly, we live in a world where that has been largely tainted. You should probably never eat tuna. That is super contaminated. But if you are going to eat it, then, you know, um, there's some research that suggests there's different kinds of tuna that have uh, lower mercury because they are in different waters. There's the smash fish. The smash fish are sardines, mackerel, anchovies, salmon and herring. And these fish are far enough down the food chain that you could say they are the lowest in mercury. Still, they're going to have some. The best option is sockeye salmon as the lowest mercury, but still it's going to have some mercury. So more than once a week is probably not a great idea. And getting your omega-3 in another fashion, like from fish oil capsules that are tested to be low mercury, at least you can probably never get it out completely, is the best way right now to really get your omega-3 fatty acids in. I have a link in the description for my recommended brand of omega-3 supplements. Uh, it's pretty high potency and it's been independently tested by Labdoor to be low mercury. And it's one of the brands that ships worldwide, which is great because not everybody's in the US. Another big area of protein, of course, is dairy. If you're considering dairy, then you have to be sure that you're actually not dairy sensitive. How do you make sure that you're not dairy sensitive? Well, the best way to do it is just skip it for three months and then do a large bolus reintroduction. So you have a cheese fest on one day and then you wait for three days and see what happens. You know, do you break out? Do you get acne? Do you get hives? Are you fatigued? Um, do you get gastric upset? All these things need to be carefully observed in the next couple of days after you have the cheese fest. And then you'll know if you're dairy sensitive I personally I skipped all dairy except butter for about two years and then I started reintroducing and there was really no problem that I could discern. So in my case, probably not dairy sensitive, but your mileage may vary. If you're not dairy sensitive, then there's a couple of protein options in the dairy department. First one is whey protein powder. If you can find clean, 100% grass-fed whey protein powder and you don't have any sweeteners in there, you put your own, like stevia, monk fruit, erythritol, then you're probably good to go. Uh, it's a great protein. It has super high uh, Diaz score. It's great for muscle growth. And of course, also probably great for uh, glomerular hypertrophy. I'm going to learn to say that word real quickly. <laughs> the other options would be things like quark, it's similar to cream cheese. Um, and there's also like uh, hard cheeses. Uh, Parmigiano Reggiano is a great example because that's my favorite cheese. It's made from grass fed cows from a certain region in Italy. It's made from A2 dairy. So the casein protein in there that makes people sensitive is already a little bit less of an allergen. And it's also been fermented for over 24 months if it's Parmigiano Reggiano. And most importantly, it's made from raw milk. So it's not been pasteurized. Most cheese, of course, is made from pasteurized milk. If it's pasteurized, you lose a lot of the function of the whey proteins that has healing effects. So whenever you do eat cheese, try to find grass-fed cheese that is from raw milk. Some of the cheeses from Austria or France will also have those attributes. One cool thing about dairy is that if you're not sensitive, or maybe even if you are sensitive, you might want to take advantage of this, it can actually lower your uric acid levels. So if that is elevated for you and you haven't been able to get it down, even though your diet is on point, then a little bit of dairy might actually help to get it down further. So now, what about the vegan options? There's not that many vegan options that I could really recommend. All the protein powders have the same issues. They are super filled with toxic pesticides and anti-nutrients. Things like rice protein, pea protein, Chickpeas also, not any better. All that stuff, if it's super processed, then you probably have a lot of pesticides in there and a lot of anti-nutrients. 
One of the more healthy options probably is something like hemp tofu or even soy-based tempeh, which is fermented. And therefore, it removes a lot of the phytoestrogens that are already in there. And it also removes some of the lectins that are a problem in soy and many other vegan proteins. One crucial point to understand is that the vegan proteins are lower, and in many cases, much lower, than animal-based proteins on the DS score list. What does that mean? As we already touched upon in the last episode, the DS score shows us how bioavailable the proteins really are. The vegan proteins have a score of below 1, and the animal proteins have a score of above 1. So if your protein source is hemp, for example, and let's say it has a DS score of 0.5, then that means if your protein intake is usually 100 grams per day, now you need 200 grams per day. That's a lot of protein. So you need to take that into account, whatever protein you're actually using, you need to factor in the DS score. And if you're trying to do a vegan diet, that can amount to a lot of protein very quickly. And if you already are limited in what amount of protein you can actually intake, then that might not be a great option for you. So we always want to get enough protein. We never want to go below the 0.6 grams per pound of body weight per day. Now, if there's other values in your blood results that indicate that you should limit protein and there's ways to replace some of that with essential amino acids or keto analogs of essential amino acids and there's probably the point where you should get some professional assistance i have a link to my coaching program in the description that's for anybody who needs some personal assistance you can set up a free short call to see if it's a good fit so now you know the right kinds of protein you know how much you need and you know which ones to avoid If you don't want to do the calculations yourself, I have a link in the description for my new report tool. It helps you calculate your calorie needs, your protein needs, and even what you got to eat on a protein fasting day. You can enter your email and it will all be sent to your email address so you'll have it handy. You can print it out, put it on the fridge, or just have it saved as a screenshot. Give this video a thumbs up if you liked it. And if you're on a podcast platform, then please give us a five-star rating and uh, drop any comments for topics you would like to see covered in the future. Until then, happy healing.